will now have our first panel discussion of the day, which we will be discussing on the topic Global Exchange, Emerging Esports Ecosystems. This session will be moderated by Mr. Timothy Shin, the founder and CEO of Yes Esports Asia Holdings Limited. Yeah. Joining him on stage are Professor Pei Chi Chung, Associate Professor, Department of Cultural and Religious Studies from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Mr. Terry Tsung, CEO and founder of Madhead. And joining us virtually, we will have Mr. Sean Hung Xiao Jie, student, president of NUS eGaming, NUS EG, from National University of Singapore. Last but not least, Dr. Anand Bojan, School of Computing, National University of Singapore. Again, we will have our Q&A session, which you can simply scan the QR code and type in your questions during the discussion. Before we start, we would like to share a video from Yes Sports sharing the incredible accomplishments in the last year. Please enjoy. for sharing with us some highlights of your accomplishments. Mr. Shin, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, honorable uh, speakers. I'm Tim Shan. I'm uh, um, the CEO of YEA, uh, who is based in Hong Kong. But our group uh, covers uh, 40 plus countries in five continents. Um, in this session, we will discuss questions on what role does Hong Kong esports play in the regional and international esports ecosystem? On top, what are the ways that government, high education, and industry uh, cultivate a thriving esports ecosystem? So, without further ado, I would like to have our panel speakers each uh, to present a five minute um, presentation to our um, guests. So, to start with, uh, I would like to invite Professor Chong. Uh, to start with uh, her presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for having me here. Um, I just would like to share that the presentation today is based upon uh, a series of conversation with uh, gamers around Asia in the past few years when I was doing my research. I'm going to talk about player-led esports ecosystem, and I'm from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Okay, so if you look at the slides here, you will be able to see some uh, detailed statistics about the global esports market. Um, there's a, a total of 2.7 billion player, and then it's uh, uh, having a market revenue of 1.1 billion. And you can see the huge number of uh, audience here where more than 50% comes from Asia. And by comparison, if we look at the esports in Hong Kong, we actually have quite a few very interesting and notable teams so far. And the active number of players by the year 2018 are around, um, is around 300,000 um, 300, people. Um, most of them comes from the age of 18 to 21. Then uh, we can pass to the, the right one for, to look at the number of professional players. There's a, actually a total of 3, 337 professional players 
being listed in the earning uh, website, eSport earning website. Okay, so by that then we can look at a few works that uh, Hong Kong has been doing in the past few years. Uh, we are not a early starter like uh, South Korea, but we have been making quite some effort um, in developing eSports. So we have a uh, government putting into a huge number of money to develop venue, to uh, allow policy uh, found for having cyberport to develop all kind of a scheme to help the, the industry. We can also have, uh, I should cannot see very clearly. So uh, we can also have um, um, uh, re uh, business, new business. We so far have around like 108 companies in, uh, in Hong Kong that's in eSports business. And then there are actually eight um, stocks um, that's been listed in Hong Kong as eSports stocks. So there's also a, a exhibition, also event. And most interestingly, we are, we are also seeing the increased number of um, tournament being hosted around the, uh, the, um, the, East, uh, the MTR malls in Hong Kong. So with that, then, um, there are actually quite a few of e key questions, key issues we might be need, be need or looking into so far. So for example, we, when we look at so many things have been done, we probably want to ask, what is Hong Kong's blueprint? Um, there's actually a lot of question about, uh, like, is, are we having a comprehensive strategy? So this will be something that we have to look internally by look, uh, thinking about the development of eSports. There's also this uh, like uh, issues about talent, how do we grow the talent? And also what are the industry that we can refer to, to in order to build a very healthy ecosystem of eSports? So are we looking into this aim of developing Hong Kong into Asia's hub uh, in international eSports thing? If we are looking, uh, aiming for this direction, then what is our uh, regional strategy and what is our global strategy? So like, you know, issues with uh, looking, uh, linking into the ecosystem in China, maybe something we can look at. And also issues about like, you know, linking with the international eSports thing uh, through certain organization and company will also be something we can look into. So here is the chart that I want to share with everybody that is based upon several um, three years of uh, interview with uh, gamers, professional gamers, and also amateur gamers in South Korea and China. And here I, I find that actually there's a very interesting um, dimension that has been overlooked in the eSports ecosystem. That is the player-led kind of public ecosystem where it is to, for us to look into the area that's beyond the business side and also the concern of cooperation. So a lot of time we are focusing on professional gamer. We are looking at their competitive uh, uh, tournament and we are also looking at the business around there. And here we're seeing the big uh, market that's be, that has been grown so far globally. But then when I look at, uh, when I talk to amateur and semi-professional gamer, uh, gamers in South Korea, I find that there's actually an uh, uh, interesting kind of uh, emerging skill set that's emerging out from the eSports competition. Um, these players, when they decide that halfway they are not pursuing their professional career, they actually will be able to turn their resource and also turn their skill into many interesting new professions that are emerging in, um, in eSports. So for example, farm manager in China, where how do you, how do people retire from eSports player, um, manage farm to, um, to make profit for certain eSports team and company. And for example, data analytics and also shoutcaster. So here on the right side, you'll see people when they are not uh, successful in becoming professional player, they transform themselves into certain kind of professional with a uh, special skill. So with that, then I would like to conclude that actually, um, so far we have been looking at eSports from the sport paradigm, but I want to, clean, uh, I want to um, um, echo or I want to pro promote the idea that eSports e is actually be beyond a simple, simple form of sports, especially right now, uh, Olympic, w, Olympic game last year just decided that they're not going to include eSports in the upcoming e uh, Olympic game. So there's actually a lot of issues that need to be 
need to be looking into, for example, internet addiction and also um, doping issues. So uh, I would like to call for this idea of a player welfare in in innovation model to see how we are able to transform a reskilling re and also upskilling type of uh, policy making to help the player to be able to grow in the much more healthy esport industry when they search, uh, pursue their uh, professionalization career. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for Professor Chong's very insightful presentation. I uh, would like to say um, I totally agree with uh, Professor Chong's uh, pro uh, proposition. We, um, uh, players' uh, welfare enhancement, uh, because at the end, uh, esports is uh, a people's game. So, um, to, uh, for our next uh, presenter, uh, I would like to welcome Mr. Sean Hang, student and president of NUS e gaming um, of Singapore. So, uh, Sean, please uh, proceed. Hi. Yeah. Um, are my slides on? All right, so hi, I'm Sean. I am a final year student at NUS School of Business, specializing in management and organization. But to most of my peers, I'm known as Bob Chuckles, president of NUS eGaming. So I've been president for over a year now, and today I'd like to share a bit about my club and esports in NUS. So NUS EG was founded 13 years ago, back in 2008, making us the oldest and most prestigious university esports club in Singapore. Today, we have over 560 members across our five gaming divisions, League of Legends, Mobile Legends, Overwatch, Super Smash Bros, and Valorant. Now, each division also caters to both esports players and recreational players, with the esports wing focusing more on competitive trainings and representing the university in competitions, while the recreational wing focuses more on community bonding and finding other like-minded players to game with. However, our meteoric rise hasn't always been smooth sailing. In 2019, we were a pale shadow of our former glory, and also coincidentally where yours truly came in. So back then, I was faced with the decision. Do I let the club die out then and there, or do I persevere on and find new ways to revitalize the club? Needless to say, I chose the latter. It was tough then, planning everything effectively from scratch, but at the same time, exciting to start afresh. Rewriting our club's motto, mission and vision, to better reflect what I believe our club represents, working to rebrand the club as a varsity sports group, and of course, clearing up the bureaucratic nightmare. These were just a handful of the challenges that I had to surmount in those early days. But I soldiered on because of my passion to build an esports community that my younger self could never enjoy. I started small, beginning first with building a core team around me. I reformed my management community by selecting students like myself who are passionate about esports and wanted to build a holistic and welcoming e-gaming community. In February this year, the seven of us launched the club's first offline Chinese New Year celebration. And though the reception was lukewarm, it was a start. We took on this momentum to begin other projects, working with the NUS Office of Student Affairs to hold a gaming marathon for students who were quarantined at the outbreak of COVID. As we continued our relentless drive to increase the visibility of our club and promote the idea that esports is a much needed boon for mental wellness, we noticed a particular trend. And that trend being that as our events were attracting more and more attendees, our club size started to increase more and more. And this also gave me a greater pool of students to recruit from. So if you take a look at this graph, we started in February with our event at 42 attendees at our event, and, uh, sorry, 42 members in the club and only 38 attendees for our event. By the time we hit August, just before school reopened, we, were had, uh, we, were, we had 369 members in our club officially registered and 164 members attending our celebra uh, celebratory events. So moving on, our ability to carry out these events and projects is not only due to the countless hours and sacrifices made by my management committee, but also due to the support we receive from external parties. The club's move to the sports office as part of the Team NUS brand institutionalized us as a varsity sports group granting us a deeper connection to the university's administration and opening up more resources for us to better train our athletes and plan, plan activities. Outside of the school, we've worked with industry partners to build an esports ecosystem that spans the tertiary education system nationwide. Organizations such as SOGA, SGA, and PVP Esports have been key partners in enabling us to hold esports tournaments through equipment rentals and prize sponsorships, 
as well as exposing students to professional development within the esports industry through workshops, courses, and internships. All our efforts have culminated in the successes that the club enjoys today. As a whole, our club has expanded over 1,400%, 14 times greater in size from when I took over. We stand down today as a connected esports community, able to find friends to play together, regardless of game genre, and talk about memes, trends, and all things e-gaming. We are one of the largest clubs in NUS and one of the largest esports clubs in Singapore. Recreationally, we are able to host weekly online sessions and bi-monthly events that attract great numbers, something that was unimaginable before. Competitively, our teams have benefited from our esports training, based on an esports doctrine we wrote from, our, uh, from scratch ourselves. In the 2020 InterVarsity Games Festival, NUS EG swept first place in three out of the four events, coming in a close second for the final event. Looking towards the future, we intend to keep forging onwards to make esports a viable career path for youth in Singapore, while making e-gaming an enjoyable communal experience within NUS. We'll be working more in hand with our student coaches to push the capabilities of our esports teams and coming up with new innovative ways to engage e-gaming enthusiasts, be it through our streaming platforms or on social media. My hope is that more companies, not just within the esports industry, will be willing to support us in our drive. As students, we are always short of funds and sponsorships to really push the boundaries of what we aim to do in terms of small scale events like doing parties to large scale tournaments involving universities or teams from other uh, countries. For, for our Peru and its member universities, I would recommend working with companies from the esports industries to extend learning opportunities to students hoping to get into the industry, be it through games development, productions, or even event organization to help foster a more enriching ecosystem. For myself, well, I'm graduating next December and considering a career in esports in which I'm a certified coach for. So if there's any company looking for passionate gamers, I'm available. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sean. Um, uh, again, uh, to, for our group, uh, in order to show our support uh, to uh, talents like yourself, uh, not only we are more than happy to uh, try to connect you to more job opportunities, but uh, we are now offering actually scholarships uh, for those uh, students who want to learn and pursue a future career in esports also. So um, now we come to the third uh, presentation. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Anand uh, Bojang, Senior Lecturer, School of Computing, also from National University of Singapore. Uh, professor, please proceed. Okay, so good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, uh, thank you for having me here uh, in this uh, exciting panel. So um, uh, are my slides visible? Oh, my slides are up on the screen. Okay, so yeah, so today I'm going to just talk about uh, um, uh, cloud gaming uh, and uh, some advance, uh, uh, advancements in the technologies. Uh, as you as uh, mentioned earlier, like right, you know, the the cloud and and the streaming in the cloud and cloud game are kind of going to you know uh, have have been an integral part of growth of this entire industry, uh, especially you know uh, streaming and viewership. And again, in future, uh, what we can expect from this uh, entire technology uh, stream. So that's uh, uh, what I'm going to talk about today. So let's let's move on. Okay, so there are uh, three areas. So one is cloud game. So it has been seen as a, um, uh, a very good business opportunity for even for carriers uh, with the introduction of 5G. And okay, so we'll see where this is. And then we will see uh, uh, something what's happening in Singapore. We are kind of also looking into uh, kind of a hybrid sports uh, using AR technologies. And I'll talk a little, a little bit on the industry academy relationship. Okay, so a quick overview on, on the cloud gaming, the type of cloud gaming we are actually talking about, uh, the entire game is run in the cloud and uh, on a video stream. Well, the entire rendering happens here on the video stream sent to the, to the player and uh, the player can be you know, using a very thin client, maybe just a VR or, or, or AR glass. Uh, you can, you can, you can play the game with some kind of a joystick or, or, or uh, kind of a input device. 
So this is a very well-known thing. And of course, there are many other ways uh, cloud can help in, in, uh, to launch the, uh, or launch and host the games. But this is a, an extreme case where cloud does everything and don't, only the video is streamed to the client and, and the client is basically the, the player is playing on the video. So there are various advantages. Probably we all know that quality, maintenance, security in all these aspects. And of course, there are lots of challenges, basically the latency, the latency is already very high, the internet latency, but then we, we do everything in the cloud and stream, the, the latency is going to further, further increase. And again, the, the bandwidth, okay, so now we are doing video streaming then, then sending some uh, game update packet. So that would be again, another concern for uh, cloud gaming. But this is uh, just a quick overview. And uh, as you can see, the 5G technology is kind of uh, promising. Uh, it has brought down the latency very, very significantly to lower levels. And I uh, can see that from uh, the connection to the edge is like uh, uh, well, the latency is just one millisecond and, and lower and uh, connecting to the cloud uh, at the, uh, uh, the, the ISP or the, 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 the service provider uh, itself or telco service provider itself is like about 20 to 50 milliseconds. But again, if it goes to public cloud, it, it is kind of uh, slightly higher, uh, it goes up to 50 to uh, 100 milliseconds. So 5G is, is, is we all talk about it, it's going to, it's a promising technology and is uh, has already you know, penetrated in many parts of the world. Um, but there is also another uh, uh, thought going on. Okay, so every time uh, when a new G comes, we always think that, no, uh, okay, this is going to improve the speed and the gameplay is going to be very smooth uh, and things like the cloud gaming is going to emerge and all those things were uh, continuously being promoted. Uh, but even this with 5G or upcoming next Gs, is this problem will is be really being solved? Um, as you can see in all these technologies, what we are actually doing is the latency at the edge is actually uh, reduced a lot, you know, up to like one millisecond. So that is the last mile uh, connectivity and, and the delay is reduced a lot. But the core network is still having lots of delay, lots of issues because uh, there is lots of legacy systems in the, in the core network that, that what I'm talking about in the middle of the network. So um, this is the part really delaying the, you know, the contribute to the, 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 the delay in the entire uh, transmission of data. So there are like even people like, you no know, uh, talk about things like, okay, uh, the internet can never be uh, used for uh, live gaming or, or cloud gaming can never happen. Especially if, if you even move into the multiplayer aspect of that, it is kind of impossible kind of this kind of uh, notions are going around um, in, in, in many places or many people talk, up, talk, like, talk negative aspects about it. Okay, so it's very true that the pipes in the middle are just getting, we are focusing, just making it, you know, the, the, the increasing the bandwidth, making it fatter than uh, improving, the, improving the speed. So this is true, accepted. And of course we cannot really um, uh, ensure that this will change in a near, near future. And uh, because of lots of legacy system is, is very, very uh, no, uh, complex thing in, in the, the core internet is very hard to change. So what we can do as a game developers, can we work around this? Can we make things better? Uh, even with uh, no, whatever we have currently in the, uh, whatever the net provides currently. So that's where we thought about uh, some new ideas in our lab. So um, there are, this is a, a simple taxonomy of uh, uh, computer games. So we can think computer games as um, you know, uh, either independent world or shared world. So basically like a, a local single play, player game, the player is playing in an independent world with an indi individual copy. And uh, if, if, if you think about the shared world, basically we, what we mean is a network multiplayer game. So we have uh, uh, every player has the individual copies playing on the individual copy, but in the, the world is shared among the rest of the players. And we also have a uh, local multiplayer, okay? So it's a kind of a shared screen and people play uh, locally uh, a multiplayer game. Okay, so the, it's a shared world and shared copy. But what is missing is this part, okay? So there is no, uh, nothing happening in this area. We saw that there's a blank and this is what we can leverage on to rebuild or rethink how the game software itself is built to make it suitable for the, you know, the current internet and uh, and uh, 5G technology. Okay, so uh, uh, independent world and a uh, shared copy. So what does it mean? Uh, can we have a one single copy of game running, but each player play in their independent world as if they are playing their own uh, independent game? Okay, so 
that's the idea. So current cloud game services, if you take a look uh, in this slide, is basically like that. You have a game server, and whenever a new player joins in, uh, a new uh, instance is uh, created and, and a complete game is hosted. And from there, uh, no, it is streamed to the, to the player. So this is the current structure. So what we are looking into, like, can we do this? Okay, so can we have a shared copy of the game and yet let the player to play in their independent world? If this is possible, of course, we have proven that we, it can be done very easily and we have done that again because it's again built based on a uh, local multiplayer idea and uh, we can just easily turn it around to, to make it uh, no, uh, an independent world shared copy feasible. And what we call this as a cloudy game. So because it's very cloud friendly kind of uh, uh, architecture. And if we do this, of course, we can have a better resource management, more fine grained brain, uh, resource allocation so that uh, no, uh, the, uh, the, the cloud uh, system itself or the, the VM here, whatever, we can operate with less virtual machines and uh, 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 our, our lower scale infrastructure. Okay, so given that, uh, how we can fit, in, fit it into the, the, what internet is providing today and of course the 5G edge computing, uh, which is uh, no, uh, uh, getting some uh, uh, lots of uh, mentions in the industry. So uh, the edge computing basically, which means like you no, know, the, the telco edges are going to provide some kind of computational power. So with our um, uh, technology where we can react to, re no, re-architect the software such that the, a single game can be shared by multiple users. Uh, so if we think about, if we take that into uh, here and fit into this uh, ecosystem, we come up with uh, this kind of architecture. We call we could be, what we call it as a, as a gamelet architecture, where the gamelet is basically something which is running in the five G edge computing. It loads games on demand. So initially, they won't have any ga any games in here. When a player wants to play a, a particular game, it is going to just you know download the game on demand. Of course, the downloading a full game is like you no know, several GBs. It will take time. So we start with a minimal content, and it will have a continuous uh, streaming of uh, uh, of the assets and, and and other contents and other player information, just in case like you no know, there is a leaderboard and there are many other players playing connected to different gamelets. Uh, so. That information again are maintained at at the the, the at the cloud uh, system level. So the cloud again controls the login, joining game, and all the stuff. But the actual game itself played locally, very which is very close to the player, which has like you know uh, as shown in the five G edges, they have just one millisecond of latency. So the player can really enjoy a very high quality game uh, when he is in this kind of architecture. And it we tremendously you know, reduce the, the bandwidth requirement at, at this area uh, from cloud to the edge. So this is kind of a new architecture we are looking into. And there are two publications, those who may really want to know uh, more details on this, please uh, refer to this. And we have implemented the whole thing in Unreal Engine. So Unreal Engine is now open source since the uh, last two years. So everything you can, you can uh, all the code and everything is shared on the internet, those who are interested. Please uh, go and take a look into this. This probably we are seeing it as a feature for uh, uh, redesigning the, you know, the the game software architecture itself to shoot it into the five G and uh, the internet. Okay, so not only that, uh, since like each each edge uh, may have some copies of the game over time, they can be even used to uh, stream the gameplay. Okay, so it's not just uh, uh, they provide uh, uh, the or they act as a host for game playing the game. They can also like stream the games played by other people in other gamelets. So that is kind of another uh, area we are looking into. So if if you are assuming this kind of streaming, there is a local game here in the gamelet that is the, the closest closest node, and this game is just going to get the game details from the backend from the cloud, and it renders everything locally here and sends the stream to the client for viewing purposes for spectators. In the case. And the spectators in this case can be even no, having very, very lightweight devices like AR, VR glasses and moving around, they can still watch the uh, game. So that's basically what's happening uh, in our lab. That's one of our research work going on. Uh, now I'm going to talk a bit more about the, the game development itself within the uh, NUS, okay? So I'm from NUS School of Computing. So we had game development module like uh, courses like no, uh, more than 15 years, but uh, 
a uh, few years back we have revamped the entire curriculum and uh, in the, in the past it is like you no know, uh, developing part and pieces of the 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 algorithms for uh, for the game engine from there we converted it totally into giving students a complete game development experience and this is because at the time when when i took over this there uh, there was you know uh, a very good uh, tool chain and the game engines as specified earlier the game engines has as as matured and they provided lots of uh, you know uh, flexibilities and features for the for the developers to quickly develop uh, prototype and develop the games so what happened is we had like uh, two courses one is game development in school of computing and the game design in the faculty of arts and social sciences and together with uh, other departments um okay this is something like the students take it take in year 3 so they learn about the game design and game development when they go to year 4 they completely involved in game development project and again that is a very very multidisciplinary so nus as a school we encourage uh, uh multi multidisciplinary collaborative work among uh, different departments so even school of business students are part of this game development project they they help in to you know promote the game marketing the game and things like that so that's a major change and yeah and not only that uh, we to make it more interesting we organize like uh, um uh, a game showcase event it's in a kind of e-sports e kind of setting where each team will put up their game and we they you know uh, invite players to play uh, uh from the university itself and again uh, i mean from the university and and, uh, and and the other other institutions regionally uh, locally so what we see here is um a very vibrant live competition among players going on and uh, no uh, of course there are some 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 small prize money and things like that but these gamers who play these games they are the one decide the grade and our students they know that when they join this course they are friend they know that this is how the module is graded you have to really make it very interesting for the gamers to play the game and compete with each other um so there are more games over yeah. the years developed so Uh, yeah. Professor, can you wrap up uh, yeah, the? Sure. Yes, you can uh, take a look into the no, uh, website here for more details. Okay, so we had a chance to uh, have, I mean, uh, collaboration with other universities uh, led by Layout VR, and uh, I mean, this is the time we were introduced to VR games, and we started uh, developing VR curriculum uh, with the uh, uh, rest of the universities. Uh, again, it is supported by Epic Games and uh, Layout VR, and we move into VR games a lot. and in singapore you can see that uh, this is something happening uh, what i call as a hybrid sports uh, okay basically you also add physical health into the already promised cognitive and social health by the the game plays okay so yeah of course this is a move and play is a very interesting thing the hardo is doing very good job uh, yeah so this is a singapore based company you can take a look into their website uh, yeah looking so for of course we have uh, we are coming up probably provide more personalized experiences uh and we can also uh, look further away in sort of this big screen here the players can be projected on the ground itself we can watch the play or uh, using your vr uh, or ar glasses great yes so okay. thank you very much uh, for uh, another okay. presentation yes so i uh think with the uh, 5g now and the launching in most asian countries millions of uh, gamers are eagerly awaiting this uh, crowdfunding to take uh, cloud uh, gaming to take place so um now we come to the last uh, presenter mr terry jung um actually he is the ceo of uh, and the founder of one of the most uh, being played uh, game in china and in asia map hub so uh, without further ado i would like to have uh, terry uh, to start his presentation thank you very much Oh, hello. So um, my name is Terry. Um, I'm the founder and CEO uh, of Madhead. So my company started in 2008, and we started to do games in 2011. So I would like to talk about more on how to put e-sport element in our game, and also the difficulty in in uh, developing the e-sport element in our game. So. Um, We started our first game, uh, first uh, mobile game in 2011, and then after that, we, in 2013, we launched uh, Tower of Saviors, Samboji Tower. 
So this game is, is getting quite popular uh, in Hong Kong, uh, Taiwan, and Singapore, and Malaysia. And at the beginning, we don't have any uh, eSport element in, in the game. But because uh, we, we, we understand the user, they, they need to, to, to compete with each other. So we put some more eSport element in starting from, from that moment. So, and starting from 2013, every year, we have a contest in different, different country and city. So even until today, but right now because of COVID-19, so everything changed online. But uh, in the past, we did offline. So uh, the benefit of doing eSport element in our game is uh, um, we, we create a lot of different influencers. Because uh, the pro player, the, the top players uh, can be, um, become one of the internet icon, and a lot of users will follow them. So that uh, our user can keep engaging our game, and then uh, more users will play our games. So eSport itself, uh, to be honest, uh, is like a marketing expense. So it's not easy to generate uh, revenue. But instead, it make the game more interesting, more meaningful, and more people are willing to stay in the game, and eventually they, they, they are willing to spend more in the game. But the difficulty is that um, um, if we only focus on eSports, it's, it's really hard to, to make money. And also, there, there's so much to do in hosting uh, a contest, being a, as a developer. Because as a developer, you, you need to do everything. Uh, you need to create the APK. You need to do the, the, the server side. You need to host the contest. So um, it's, it's, it's in high cost. But the most important thing is not, it's not easy. I think it's not really easy to make the, the game fair. Because uh, in, in, in our mind, uh, if you host a contest, uh, hold a eSport, you, you, you need to make sure that the, the, the game is fair. So we need a lot of costs, expenses to, to make something like that. Especially in the past, we, we did it offline, it's e more easy to handle. But why right now we do it online? Because in online, there are so many people who can really join the, the contest. So uh, it make it more difficult to, to to, to make sure it's fair. So um, uh, we did it this year in online, and then we, to be honest, we failed a few times, and then we, we, we changed, and then we, we, we keep improving. So um, what I want to say to the audience is um, eSports e is, is, is interesting, wonderful, but it's, it's, it's also challenging. So I want to give you a, a, my, my feeling a, a, about eSport or even the, the, the COVID-19. It's similar because it's, it's difficult. So, um, but I would like to say, when it's difficult, you come with a high risk. But it, when high risk came, you will come with high return potentially. So um, if, you, if you really think it will be the trend, it will be your future, uh, just work hard, just like you're working hard in 2020, in COVID-19 time. Um, you, I, I'm sure the, the reward might be, or will possibly much bigger than, than uh, different time spent. And also, when you are working, working on the, the eSport, um, even though uh, it's not easy to, to see the, the return in this moment, but the, the, the return could be could be huge uh, potentially in the future. So that's what I want to share to all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Ms. Zhang. Uh, now we come to uh, a Q&A uh, question um, with our uh, panel speakers. Um, and uh, I would like to uh, present, um, uh, ask some questions uh, for our panelists. Uh, first, um, the two questions, and maybe for uh, Professor Chong. First is, how do you see Hong Kong uh, influencing the region in esports and the cultural development of the community around esports? Thank you for the question. I think we have um, 
big potential because it, if we look at other supporting industry, we're already quite strong. We're already quite ready. But we are not like uh, South Korea or China that has already been having East Wall for so many years. So I think um, there's actually kind of continuity. For example, um, the internationalization aspect by setting up standard, connecting China to the global eco ecosystem, bridging Chinese and English uh, environment, then that would be really good for Hong Kong. There's also this dimension of uh, promoting uh, a kind of uh, e-sport into the global uh, Olympic game com um, scene. Uh, we have this a Asia Electronic Esport Federation that is the only authority, highest authority, by connecting all of the nation around the world. So we have Asian Games now in the year 2022 to already start to include eSports in, in part of the competition. But then uh, we can also, by using this organization, then we can push more forward to connect to the global eSports culture. So um, there's also another uh, um, expectation that I think Hong Kong can have very good um, take very good role, which is to cultivate and grow the amateur and also semi-professional industry. How do we actually provide certain kind of model, innovation model to push forward for upskilling and also reskilling in the current industry now? Thank you. Thank you. So one more uh, related question to Professor Chong. So at the end, how do you see Hong Kong differentiate uh, herself uh, from other esports hubs, especially in the Asia region. Okay, so so I can talk about uh, com comparison to South Korea and China. Uh, if you look at South Korea and China, it's very huge fan base. There's a lot of uh, very competitive player, but Hong Kong we're still in the growing side. So probably we can look into this industry dimension to create entrepreneur and also create a business and and link with. Um, other industry like you know market with uh, South Korea and China, and China and also Taiwan and even for so, uh, Southeast Asia. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, then the next question uh, will be for uh, Sean. Um, what trends do you see in professionalizing esports within universities? Because you are a student and they're also the president of the university club. And what are some of the challenges you will uh, foresee? So oh, one of the interesting trends that I've noticed is that there is a greater lab, well, more number of young hungry players who want to prove themselves that they have what it takes to be the very best, uh, be it at their game, be it at their level of play. And then there's also at a university level or at an organizational level, more recognition of esports as a legitimate sport and more people are starting to buy into it. And then at the same time, one of the more interesting facets is that there's a rise in mobile gaming. More and more people are getting into mobile gaming and um, the different applications in there because it's very accessible and then that's where esports also comes into play when it comes to mobile gaming like mobile legends and Rob Rip are such a big hit because they're so accessible and they're so relatable and you can really play it on the go yeah. and as for the challenges there are multiple challenges with professionalizing esports one of them is still unfortunately the stigma still attached to gaming I believe the previous speakers have mentioned it that um, especially for Asian parents <laughs> there is this stigma that gaming is bad for grades um, then again with uh, the current trends shifting forward, you can reassure your parents that there are scholarships for gaming, so it's not always a bad thing. And also, one of the downsides is that gaming is still viewed very much so as a male-centric activity. Even among my club, I only seeing about 20% to 25% uh, ratio of females to male. So most, most of the gamers are still males, and among all my competitive teams, I have like one female player, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, out of like 30-something or 40, uh, athletes for the school, we only have one female player. And that's something that should be addressed. Hopefully, we can push the idea that gaming isn't just for guys. It's actually girls can um, really take part and show that they are just as good or better than us. And also, um, one of the more meta or macro level challenges that we face is elevating the level of competition nationwide. Because esports in Singapore, while we've been having at it for quite some time, it hasn't really hit the level where it's completely acceptable, even among all the universities, that this is the level of play we want. Some universities still aren't really fully buying into the concept of esports as a competitive event. And um, yeah, and some, that's why some schools, uh, the teams that they send to take part in tournaments, they, the level of play that they 
they come up with is a lot lower than, I'll say, um, not to brag, but my school, because we actually train for our tournaments. And so one of the challenges is to really raise up the entire level of uh, play in the country so that there is a consistent level of competition to play against. Thank you. Uh, I couldn't um, uh, disagree. I, could, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, for example, uh, last year, um, during my uh, meetings and interaction with more than 100 universities around the world, uh, for those in Europe uh, and some in Asia, like Australia, they already have some kind of um, scholarship programs. And uh, most of them actually have a uh, dedicated uh, arena, uh, large and small, for their uh, students' enjoyment and uh, training. So that's why uh, I think it's uh, more or less a deficiency in uh, some of the major Asian countries like Hong Kong and uh, Singapore, uh, because uh, uh, universities are not that truly uh, so-called supportive uh, for this kind of uh, initiative. Yeah, and that's why uh, for our group, we have um, uh, launched our scholarships for those students who are um, uh, planning to pursue a career and also uh, for this year, we've kicked up a global series of tournaments called Girls Power uh, due to the much underrepresentation of uh, female gamers in the present uh, ecosystem. Yeah. So the next question uh, will be for uh, Anand. Um, there are two parts also. First is, uh, what does the Singapore esports scene look like? How does it work with other hubs in the region, such as Hong Kong, uh, in your opinion? Okay, so yeah, that's a good question. Thanks for asking this. Uh, again, um, as uh, mentioned early, uh, early by uh, Sun, that uh, Singapore, again, uh, people see that uh, have this negative stigma a lot. And uh, even though esports is being promoted by um, the government bodies and, and private entities here and lots of organizations, um, but the, 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 the growth is very, in a, in a way, it's very slow. Um, as you can see here, um, uh, there are only few teams in Singapore as of now, and uh, if you see the, the winners, the, I mean, the, 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 the uh, people who earn, earn, make money out of it, is you can see that there's one very top, very high level, and the next second high level is uh, no, very, very low, so it's a very huge gap, and it's just seeing like one or two very successful things really you know, um, uh, makes people to fear about what will happen in, into the future of their career. So because of this thing, um, and Singapore also, you know that uh, they, we, we try to place ourselves as, as a, one of the best educational uh, system in the world. Uh, so the focus is more towards uh, education than people like think that going through esports is kind of a uh, waste of time and things like that. But yeah. given that recently there are, uh, especially in the last two years uh, after you know, SEA game, games has, has included, uh, Esports. Uh, there are lots of again uh, interests. Uh, I can see there is a, that a slowly the, the mindset is changing, uh, and a new kind of uh, organizations are set up to to come up with uh, local leagues and local policies, uh, local you know uh, rules uh, at local level, regional level, and they again like we like to position ourselves as a, as a uh, global leader in, in uh, coming up with these policies uh, for the entire world. Yep. Actually, you're um, right. Yeah. Um, early this year, my friend uh, in Singapore, Nicholas, he sent me a photo uh, actually having the Prime Minister <laughs> uh, engaging in uh, eSports uh, learning section. So I think this is a very good initiative by the Singapore government. Yeah. Yes. So, and a second, there is a second part question. How does Singapore eSports community differ from others in the region, which you have briefly mentioned? Is there anything you have heard at uh, through this and other discussions that uh, you think can be learned uh, from maybe this uh, upper section and uh, this uh, cyberport event uh, to enhance the further development of uh, esports in Singapore. Yeah, that's a very good related question. Um, one thing I would uh, I would uh, I would say here is like the um, the Singaporeans here, the players here, uh, instead of just looking into Singapore players as, as an example, they need to really look into, you know, look out and uh, look worldwide, the players and what's happening in, in, in the entire ecosystem and things like that. So this knowledge and awareness uh, basically is very important, I think, which we can actually bring in from a much earlier uh, age. Uh, we try to know the educational system should, sub, should, uh, probably should support it to bring this knowledge and awareness uh, from much earlier age so that you know, the, 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 there will be a, a better positive aspect towards, towards this entire thing. Yeah, so 
Yeah, that's right. what I say Singapore can do uh, to really grow in this area. Yeah. Yes, I, actually, I, I am, uh, I'm very optimistic that uh, Singapore um, in no time uh, should have a, a very uh, advanced progress uh, in the development of esports, more or less, uh, hopefully, in Hong Kong also. Yeah. So uh, now we come to the um, last uh, questions for uh, Terence, uh, because he's a game developer, game publisher. Uh, but uh, the first question is, um, uh, how do you think um, we can nurture esports talents, say in Hong Kong? Um, I think it's all about market driven. So um, it's not easy for, for, for me, I think it's not easy to put much forces to, to, to any market. But one of my suggestions is um, uh, maybe we, we can do something in the university side because uh, what I know this moment, um, most of the university, they don't deliver practical experience to, to the uh, university student. Just for example, um, when, when we hire programmers, uh, we have the cooking test. But um, for the cooking test, it's very relevant because uh, they need to pass the cooking test so that they, they are really capable on doing their job in my company. But um, most of the university students fail because they, they didn't have those experiences when they are uh, in the university. Because they, yeah, they don't just, they just, just, they just don't have the experience. So uh, I think uh, there might be something we can do uh, at the university to to create their interest. They they want to learn some more about the industry. They want to have more practical experience. So uh, then eventually you'll be market driven. If there's a very well-paid job, very good uh, opportunity, the people will really go into it. And we don't need a, a big force to force people to go to those areas. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. So there is a, a second part question. Uh, because you are a, one of the most successful uh, game publisher in China, Hong Kong, uh, Asia, uh, how do you see being a game publisher um, can uh, participate and enhance the development of esports uh, either in Hong Kong or in the region? Um, first thing I need to see, if eSports is getting popular, we, 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 we will be benefit from, from, from this trend for sure. So that's why we, we want eSports to be popular in our region. Um, second thing is, um, first, uh, second thing is, we, at least we need to do good in our game because uh, we need to make sure our game is good in quality. And we also need to uh, put some eSport element in our, in our game. And also, we need to support, just, just like what other people do. Um, when you see some good player, so can you, uh, can you, can you able to, to search them and then give them resources and, and make sure they, they, they have the potential to be, to be successful? So um, I think... Uh, we, we try our best in different areas to make sure this is going to be good, and eventually we, we can benefit from, from, from this trend. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. So um, because of the overrun um, uh, in, in the uh, panel, um, I, uh, we are not going to uh, go through the public uh, question section. Um, I would like to put a, a conclusion uh, section um, and uh, my comments. Uh, derived from the presentations and uh, the questions just asked um, uh, for our panel guests are as such. First, um, we have to do uh, much more in terms of uh, the uh, gamers' welfare um, enhancement, uh, the recruitment of um, uh, talents uh, from either universities or from the community, um, the fostering of um, the esports career development maybe as early as um, when the, the talents are still uh, in their university uh, years. And uh, last but not uh, least, uh, because the whole Asia is entering a new uh, technological 5G age, uh, as Anat um, mentioned, uh, we should uh, fully take advantage 
of this uh, technolo technological development in order to uh, ensure the next generation of uh, esports games uh, and also the gamers uh, can uh, fully enjoy and take advantage. Um, and uh, last but not least, I would like to thank uh, all our panel guests uh, from Hong Kong and from Singapore to participate in this uh, very uh, fruitful uh, discussion. So uh, thank you very much and uh, uh, hope we can uh, cooperate uh, more in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Shen, for guiding us through such an interesting conversation um, on the way forward for Hong Kong as an emerging hub for esports. We hope to take these lessons with us as we make progress.